The scripture reading this morning is from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming into the house, he said to her, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason... The holy child shall be called the Son of God, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this story, this scene at the very beginning of the Christmas story. The moment in which we begin to understand that God became a single cell. That Jesus, you left all of the glory of heaven to begin an existence as the smallest particle of a human existence could be. And then grew through all of that to become our Savior who was born in Bethlehem that day so many years ago. We celebrate that today. We thank and praise you for who you are and for what you have done. Amen. So, did you know or find out somehow what you were going to get for Christmas this year? I'll bet you some of you, some of you snuck around trying to figure out what was going to be your gift Do you remember when you were young how you used to sneak around your parents' bedroom or find the hall closet or get a peek at what they got you? Maybe under their bed or somewhere. Did you ever do that? If you did, and you have children now, I can almost guarantee you that they did or are doing the very same thing. Now, at the risk of embarrassing some of you husbands here, I will refrain from asking you to put up your hand if you still give in to that temptation of peeking at your gifts. Probably a more important question I should be asking is, how do you receive the gifts you're given? Are there times at which the gift you got wasn't at all what you had hoped for? Are there times in which the gift you're given you really don't want? Sadly, too many gifts that are given with a lot of thought and care are received apathetically or even critically. Did you know that the busiest days for retail stores are the three or four days after today, Christmas Day? Why would that be? Well, I think you can begin to imagine returns. Clothing items are the most returned. As a matter of fact, $9 billion of gifts are returned or exchanged after Christmas. $9 billion. The average cost of gifts returned is between $35 and $50 per item. And it's not just material gifts that we have trouble accepting. Sometimes grace is not part of our getting around this time of year. But how can we season our getting? You see, we've been on this journey of seasoning the season. We've looked at seasoning our gathering, seasoning our giving, and seasoning our glorifying, and today seasoning our getting. 
As Paul says in Colossians 4, verse 6, let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt. Salt adds flavor. It always brings something good to the table. Are you bringing something good to the table by how you receive gifts? How do we season our getting with grace? Well, maybe looking at one of the most beautiful stories of how to receive a gift will help us. In Luke chapter 1, we read it a little bit earlier, the angel Gabriel startles a young teenage girl by the name of Mary with an unexpected visit. Now, this young woman who was engaged to a carpenter from Nazareth has marriage on her mind. But even though the angel has told her that she doesn't need to be afraid, the message the messenger continues to startle her by describing what God has on his mind. And it's an unbelievable scenario, literally. Unbelievable. When Mary picks herself up off the ground, the angel attempts to explain how it's possible for her to have a child without being impregnated by her future husband. Mary's head is still spinning. Her heart must just be pounding away inside of her. But apparently from what we see and hear, her soul is completely at rest. Listen again to these marvelous words. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Wow. That's how to receive a gift. Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. I'm God's to do with whatever He chooses. May it be done to me according to your word. May God have His will done in my life. Graciously, humbly, willingly, gratefully even, receiving this news. But think about this for a minute. This gift, and I put that in air quotes, was going to turn Mary's world upside down. Everything she might have imagined about what her life would be like with Joseph changed from that moment on. Her purity would be questioned. Joseph's purity would be questioned. And purity being one of the most important things in a young woman's life before marriage. Mary's life changed from that moment on forever. Sometimes there are things that happen to us like what happened to Mary. Things that God wills or allows that we may not fully understand or even see as a gift. You may not have a clue what to do with whatever it is you've been given. You may even feel that you're not ready physically, emotionally, or spiritually for the challenges that God may yet bring into your life or has already allowed into your life. But God knows the stuff you're made of. He knows that you will not break because He will also give you the grace you need to face whatever comes into your life. How do I know? Well, because Paul tells us of his own personal struggle with something that God allowed into his life. And Paul, a human being just like the rest of us, if he was able to sort through this, then there's hope for you and I to be able to sort through whatever mess we have been given, gift we've been given. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 9, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was, listen to these two words, given me, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. I've said many times before that Greek word for thorn is not just a little rosebud thorn that's only like a centimeter long or even less than a centimeter long. No, 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 no. We're talking a chunk of wood. Another way of describing it would be a stake in the flesh, a large piece of wood. There was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, 
to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. Now, I don't believe that in one afternoon, the space of about 15 minutes, Paul went, oh, please, God. Five minutes later, oh, please, God. Oh, please, God. Here's what I imagine happened. That Paul was in such agony and pain with this stake in his flesh, this thorn in his flesh, that he got to the point where he cried out to God, God, please, I don't think I can handle this anymore. Take it. And then things were quiet for him. And maybe maybe he felt like he could carry on the rest of the day and the next day and the next week and then two weeks or three weeks or a month later. The, the agony of this situation rose to a point where he couldn't handle it anymore and he cried out again. And then through that whole process again, maybe of weeks or even months, and then the third time crying out again, but never getting an answer until after that third time. Because he says in verse 9, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Wow. Paul said a thorn was given him, and then this answer, this gift was given him. My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Do you think Mary would have felt weak? Absolutely. Being the one out of all the Hebrew young girls who was chosen to bear the Messiah. Do you think she felt up to the task in that moment? I don't don't think so. But to the degree that I can do what I otherwise would be unable to, that is the grace and power of God at work in my life through my weakness. Let me repeat that. To the degree I can do what I otherwise would be unable to. That is the grace and power of God at work in my life through my weaknesses. Paul is one example of God's grace empowering someone to be able to handle something that God gave them. Job, from the Old Testament, is another. We're told that in one day Job lost everything. Oxen and donkeys and servants killed by raiders. Sheep and servants destroyed by fire. Camels and servants destroyed by other raiders. Sons and daughters who were partying in one house and a great wind destroying the home with no survivors. What was it that Job said after all that horrible news he got? In Job chapter 1, we read this. Then Job arose and tore his robe shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God's grace in Job's life helped him look at his circumstances, and instead of cursing God... He was able to assess his situation with insight that few ever have. I came into this world with nothing. I'm going to leave this world with nothing. So everything in between is something I can bless God for. You notice what he said in verse 20? Or what it said in verse 20? Then Job arose and tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and what's next? Worshipped. Just park there for a moment. He worshipped. His life is absolutely devastated. Completely devastated. Not just his physical prosperity, but his children. Gone. And he worshipped. We might not see or understand what or why God allows something in our lives. Job sure didn't. And like Mary, it may take years to see, to understand the full picture, the outcome of everything. But her example, Mary's example, and the example of Paul and Job can be beacons in our lives, showing us a way through whatever we may be facing. How to let God's grace move in and through our lives to season our getting. Let me shift gears here. And 
talk for just a moment about the greatest gift that has ever been offered and how you can receive it if you haven't yet. The gift is a double gift. The gift of forgiveness, of sin, and the gift of eternal life. They're, the kind of two are packaged in one. The motive on the mind of God who is the giver is unconditional love. The gift wrap was human skin. Jesus Christ, who was whipped, bruised, beaten, and spiked and bleeding, icy cold, corpse-like, dead, hanging on a cross. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. The penalty of your sin is death. But rather than letting it come down full force on you, God put that on His Son, Jesus, and He died. But then God raised Him back to life. Jesus now stands free from sin. If the payment for sin is death, he paid it. And then when he rose again, he doesn't have to, death and sin can't touch him anymore. He stands free from sin, yours and mine, because he already died. And now if you admit that you're a sinner and need someone to save you from your sin, you can stand in Jesus forgiven. In Romans 6, we read the wages of sin is death. The verse goes on, but the gift of God, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. As Paul tells us in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved, that is from your sin, from going on to hell. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. If by faith you reach out for this gift that God wants to give you, you will be forgiven of your sin. You will have experienced new life and you will be able to enter into heaven someday and enjoy an eternity with all others who have been born again. John chapter 1 verses 10 to 12 tells us this. He, Jesus, was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and those who were his own did not receive him, but as many as received him. To those who believe in his name, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Some people have a really difficult time receiving this gift. To them it sounds too simple. They feel like there's something more they have to do in order to deserve God's gift of forgiveness and eternal life. But that's just the point. None of us deserve it. We deserve hell because of our sinfulness. Sin. A willful breaking of one of God's laws. The biggest being to love Him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But you've loved yourself more. You've loved your stuff more. You've loved your money more. And you've shoved God off to the side and put yourself in the center of your little universe. Now it's the universe. All God asks is that you be willing to turn from your life of sin and self-centeredness, turn toward Him, and call out to Him to forgive you through the death that Jesus died on the cross once for all. God's greatest gift is here this morning with your name on it, wrapped up in love. Will you reach out in faith and take hold of it? I want to give you that opportunity right now. There are lots of people here this morning in this room who have already received this gift. If you really do want to know that you are forgiven, if you really do want to know that you are a child of God, and want to be able to know with certainty that God will receive you into a heaven for eternity, will you pray quietly in your heart right now? Heavenly Father, I admit that I am a sinner. I've been going my own way instead of yours. Right here, right now, I am willing to turn from my sin and start following you, listening to you, obeying you, loving you you. Please forgive me of all my sin. Take out my old clogged, hardened heart and give me a new heart and new desire to love you as I should. Thank you for giving me your son Jesus and his spirit and making me your child. 
by faith. Amen. If you prayed that prayer in faith, believing, God will testify to your spirit by his spirit that you are his child, that you are forgiven, and that his life, eternal life, is beginning to invade your life right now. Also, if you prayed that prayer, will you do something for me? Will you text me, contact me through the church email or phone number and let me know? I'd like to be able to rejoice with you. One more thing. If you have just received God's gift or if you have already received it, don't keep it to yourself. God's gift is a gift to be shared That's what the shepherds did the day that Jesus was born. In Luke chapter 2, we read this, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Here it is. Here it is. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. There are so many who need to know who Jesus really is and the gift that God is offering through him. Don't leave the greatest Christmas gift unwrapped today. And please don't leave the greatest Christmas gift unshared today either. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we thank you for the greatest Christmas gift that was ever given. Forgiveness of sin and eternal life. Gift. Nothing we could earn. Nothing we deserve. Just simply a gift from your heart of love to us. Thank you for this awesome, amazing free gift. Help us by faith to either, first of all, take hold of it. Or if we already have. To be people who are willing to share it. Excited to share the gift of your love with others so that together we can journey to an awesome, awesome future and eternity. We thank you and praise you, Lord Jesus. Amen.